cast as well. All right. And there we go. Hello. Okay. So I think we're live, up and rolling here. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody today um, to, this is sort of a double whammy. This is uh, one of Coa Sporting Optics um, events uh, that we do each Saturday, our live webinars, um, and we're hosting with Elvro Jaramillo uh, today, the author of Birds of Chile, uh, New World Blackbirds, countless articles, um, <laughs> tons of stuff. Uh, a guy that I thought was going to be a lot older than he was when I first met him years ago. I, I'm a lot older now. Yeah, yeah. We're, this is what I expected 20 years ago when we met, you know, uh, whenever it was. At any rate, um, just a quick a bit of business. We're also live streaming uh, as part of the biggest week in American birdings um, and time and optics, virtual optics alley. And so we're being, you know, uh, live streamed over there as well. Um, I just wanted to tell everybody that to remind everybody for those that are here as part of the optics alley, uh, we're doing this again um, as part of our big normal biggest week celebration. Normally we'd be up in Ohio at that event, uh, working with our vendor time and optics, selling optics. Um, with that canceled, like everything else in the world, um, we are doing a virtual event. So uh, for those that are here with time and optics, I uh, wanna let you know to go and you can check out for special pricing on, um, on some of the products. Um, that we, we have available as we would have at the actual event. Um, it's shoptimeandoptics.com. And more importantly, 5% of every purchase um, does indeed get forwarded over to the Black Swamp Bird Observatory to support uh, their research and conservation efforts. And that's the real important thing I wanted to talk about. But with no further ado, I'm going to just drop into darkness and leave it to Elvaro Jaramillo. Okay. Thanks, El. All right, no problem. Hey, thanks everybody for um, <clears throat> tuning in and um, uh, wanting to find out a little bit more about uh, pelagic birding, especially in California and the West Coast. I'm gonna talk a little bit too about um, further south in Chile um, toward the end, uh, but give you an introduction to pelagic birding, some of the birds we see, how it works, and uh, you, you know uh, what the boats look like and so forth. So we'll just sort of get get going right here. And there's um, you can ask questions, um, you know, on the on this forum as well as there's a Facebook uh, set of questions that we can, you know, deal with maybe at the end. Um, if something comes up that you know just looks really sort of uh, you know sp specific to that what we're talking about right there and then we we might just uh, try to um, answer it right away. But let's just uh, get going here and um, show you a bit about what this pelagic birding is all about. So one of the things you've got to think about is we live on planet Earth, but planet Earth is really mostly water. So when you're birding, you're birding most of the time in the uh, land-based part of our planet and you're missing most of the planet. Most of it is water. And that's what we're talking about here is birds that are out in the offshore realm of, of of the earth. So this is what most of your world looks like. And how many of you have actually seen that where you can't see the coast any side of you? It's few, few of us actually. The other thing is to, you know, sort of separate the idea of a seabird versus a pelagic bird, what all this means. This is a ring-billed gull. A ring-billed gull is found all over North America, for example. You can see them in, you know, right in the center of Canada and the U.S. And it's a seabird in that you know, at some, some places you can see them on the coast and you might be able to see them a few miles offshore. Um, but it, it is not a pelagic bird. When we're talking about pelagic birds, we're talking about those species that are offshore that you will have a hard time seeing um, unless you're well out in the ocean. You know, Sabin's gull here on a fork-tailed storm petrel. You can see Sabin's gulls if you go to the Arctic, um, but, you know, but most people, probably see them offshore on a pelagic trip. 
hard pressed to see a forktail storm petrel other than on a boat trip, a uh, pelagic trip, because you know where they go to nest, they nest in these islands up north, hard to get to, and they come in at night. So you know if you want to see a forktail storm petrel, you need to go on a pelagic birding trip. Now um, this picture here of the the world with all of these colors, each one of these is a different project that's tracking a seabird, and uh, they put it all together to show you how these ocean birds really, you know, are found all over the world's oceans, really sort of even in the middle of the ocean, there are some of these seabirds out there. Um, so the world is really full of seabirds, um, although in many places when you go out offshore, the densities are quite low. So it all depends. And fortunately, California and the west coast of South America have high densities of seabirds. So they're really great places to go uh, pelagic birding. In fact, often it's the west coast of continents that have all of the uh, seabird densities. This is the kind of boat we would use out of Half Moon Bay. This is the new Captain Pete, one of the, the boats that, that we charter um, to, to go seabirding. That's about 53 feet long, so we're talking 15 meters or so, and you, you know, will take 20 to 30 people on a, on a trip like this. And um, they, um, all, all the seabird uh, birders, you know, on the West Coast uh, charter um, fishing boats to go do their, their trips. So on, at least on the Pacific, people, none of the birders own their own boats. So, you know, that means that there'll be different boats depending on where, where you're going, what you're doing. And this is a map of, of what a trail uh, of uh, a seabird uh, pelagic birding trip might look like, starting in Hapoon Bay over on the coast on the, on the right there. And, you know, we'll head out over this flat shelf, and I'll talk to you about this a little bit later, for a couple of hours of, of just travel where you're in water that isn't isn't that deep. In fact, it's about 300 feet deep, 100 meters or so, until you get to where it really drops off these canyons, Pioneer Canyon, and what we call the continental shelf edge, where water becomes really deep, and you're then truly in, in the marine pelagic realm. And it does take a couple of hours to get there. So you're talking about these trips being a full day trip of eight to 10 hours. Some of them even go to 12 hours, depending on what you're trying to see, what you're trying to do. And you know you will gauge how what you do, where you go, um, depending on on the conditions um, that are that are out there. But this is the kind of thing that happens. You go and meander, look for concentrations. Here, you know, we actually saw Manx shear water halfway through that little spot there. Says Manx found Scripps's Merlet just offshore uh, from the continental shelf edge. Lazan Albatross, pretty good day actually, pretty good day. And then uh, on our way back, also a stone petrel flock and another Scripps's Merlet. And then we sort of, you know, there's a point in time where you just got to get home and the line becomes straight. You're just heading back to the barn. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that people ask, especially if they've never been on one, how you do this and specifically how you avoid getting seasick because seasickness can happen. Uh, it can, it's, it's one of those things that can happen to anybody, even people who've been out there forever. There's a certain day that suddenly, uh oh, it's my day. Um, other people never, it never happens. And then there's some poor souls where, you know, they see the water and they get seasick. Um, so it's a personal type of, you know, variation that happens. But there are some things you can do to help yourself out. One of them is to get good amount of sleep beforehand. And this can be tough because people are really excited. You know, they can't get to sleep because next day they're going to go see albatrosses. But prioritize getting sleep. Um, I would say celebrate after the pelagic, not before. So unless you've been out there forever and you know what it's like, don't you know, avoid alcohol the night before. While you're on the trip, eat. Um, you know, I, I like to have crackers. Some people like to have ginger snaps and or um, various other things, you know, even that you can just sort of have your stomach working on something throughout the trip. Some people don't like to eat anything on a boat trip. That would be bad for me. I, I need to munch on something. Drink water, sunscreen. Even in situations where there's, you know, a lot of cloud layer, you can get sunburn, especially if you're out there for hours and you're trying to, you know, you're outside so most of the time. So also stay outside. Try to avoid going into the cabin because the cabin is where a lot of people sometimes, you know, get 
uh, sort of start feeling a little odd when you can't see the horizon. Look at the horizon, that's important. And also concentrate on that, the fact that you're seeing all these birds, whales, and things that are happening. Concentrate on what you're seeing and enjoy what you're seeing and your mind will actually go to that rather than focusing in on the fact that you sort of feel a little weird. Um, you know, you know, without sounding um, dismissive, uh, seasickness is not in your head, it's real, but your head can make it worse. <laughs> so if you're like worried about it, worried about it, worried about it, 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 it's, it, it can happen. If you are actually relaxed about it and then you're focusing on other things and, and thinking positively that you're going to have a great time, nothing's going to happen to you, more likely than not, you won't get seasick. But you know, there's the physiology that's, that takes, um, you know, precedence over any of that. And if in doubt, if it's your first time, you don't want to sort of have it be, a, you know, an unknown, take medication. There's over-the-counter, there's prescription medication. You can talk to your doctor about all that. Uh, read online about the medications available for seasickness. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, the conditions, um, I, I often will get that a question of, well, when is it good to go out there? Um, and it just depends day to day, even hour to hour, it can change. If the wind picks up um, and, you know, it can go from being flat calm to choppy. So keep that in mind. Um, you just never know. Uh, you have to really sort of be out there and uh, see what it's like, uh, or at least have, you know, the, the buoy data that's coming in to know what, what it's like at that present moment. This Boat, the Huli cat that's actually riding that massive wave, that is a real photo. It's not on a birding trip. We will never do that on a birding trip, but that's when they were filming a movie uh, called Chasing Mavericks. And the, uh, the boat, as it was filming, got into a situation where it, it rode this massive wave called Mavericks. And uh, you want to avoid that, let's put it that way. Um, but what you're at, what you're dealing with out, out there in terms of weather is wind, the swell, the swell or sort of the ocean waves and swells can be really big and you might not feel them out there if they're well spaced. That's the swell period. And all of this varies day to day. You can have a big swell, well spaced and you'll have a comfortable ride. You can have a wind pick up, you know, 10 extra knots and suddenly becomes choppy. So all of these things are things you might want to talk about with, uh, you know, the tour operator and also know when things are canceled. Usually boat trips are canceled when the captain decides that it's not safe and doesn't want to go out there and put anybody at, at risk. So the captain makes the call. It's not the birders that make the call. Um, so there's a lot of variables and sometimes, uh, you know, you'll so I've had people come to me and say, oh my God, there's a 12 foot swell out there. We can't go out there. We go out there and it's flat calm because the 12 foot swell is so widely spaced, you can't even feel it. But why do you do this, right? You go out to see these birds like black-footed albatross, which is the most common of our albatrosses in California. And uh, you've got to get out beyond the continental shelf. You have to do those two hours of driving out there to get into the uh, potential for seeing black-footed albatross. And here in this map, you see that red color there? This, that's the coast of Western North America from British Columbia down into uh, Southern California. And the red is where the highest concentration of marked black-footed albatrosses are found. So these are satellite tag birds. And you'll see that right there, we're in the middle of that where it says Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. We're, that's roughly where we are in Half Moon Bay. And this stretches from Cordell Bank, which is an area that you know, boat trips go out of called Bodega Bay down to Monterey Bay, which is another well-known um, uh, birding destination for pelagics. And we do trips out of uh, all of those as well as Morro Bay down south. Um, and, you know, Lazan albatross is the other albatross we might go and, and get to see out, out there and they're becoming more common, which is really interesting. Um, they nest in Central Pacific and over, you know, on the, uh, Western Pacific, but there's also this little colony of them in Guadalupe Island in, Me in Mexico. And uh, that colony is growing and most of the birds are banded with these red bands that have numbers on them. And most of the lazy and albatrosses we see now have bands from Mexico. So we're seeing this growing population of birds from Mexico. And if you, lazy and albatrosses strikes a chord, you've heard about them before, wisdom is the oldest known bird on Earth at 69 years old, and she's a Lazan albatross. Uh, 
banded by famous ornithologist Chandler Robbins, who passed away a few years ago. So these are really neat birds, long lived, you know, they roam around all over the ocean and your chance of seeing them in many cases, unless you're going to breeding colony, is to get out on a pelagic trip to see them. Now, one of the things that really gets people going is rare birds, you know, uh, on our very first pelagic trip that we did out of Half Moon Bay, in a period of time where there were no trips that went out of Half Moon Bay, the very first trip we saw a super rare bird, a short-tailed albatross. This is the individual here with um, what it looks like, you know, sort of like a robotic individual with all this electronics in the back. It was a bird that was being satellite tracked from a project in Japan because in Japan, this species had basically gone extinct after World War II through the feather trade, various other things. Um, but now they're really increasing in numbers. So we've got over a thousand now in the world and it looks like a big version of the black-footed albatross with this sort of beautiful pink bill with a blue, blue tip. Um, and it turns out that this individual, Y18, was part of a project where they'd moved some babies from one island to establish a secondary breeding island in, in Mukojima. And we were able to see its southernmost um, extension of its movement right across the entire ocean when it got to California, got to Hapun Bay. We saw it, it turned around and started going back north again. And that picture there you see of the bird fledging is Y18, the day that that she fledged from the nest. So we suddenly, you know, were part of this really impressive story. And we actually, our photographs of our bird uh, were on the news in Japan and so forth. We became famous in Japan for a day. And um, it, it was just really neat to see a rare bird that also was part of a project that was, you're trying to preserve this bird. And we had a little uh, tidbit of, of um, you know, uh, aiding in the information gathering for that, that situation. Um, as well as it being our first pelagic trip out of Hakun Bay. That sealed the deal for us, that this was a great place to go out birding from. So we've been doing them ever since. And you know, staying on the idea of rare birds, North America's first uh, Salvin's albatross showed up in July 2014, a bird we found and we were able to spend over an hour with it. So it was, that was wonderful. We've seen first California white and petrel, wedge, you know, tailed shearwaters, great shearwaters, all sorts of rare birds, but also, we see the common birds and the common birds for a lot of people are the ones that we may get used to because we go there all the time. But in fact, you know, are, are not common if you live in Kansas, let's say, you know, these are the birds that are sort of the bread and butter birds are amazing. People sometimes also ask me, do I have dreams of what could show up? And this is the bird I really dream about showing up in California. And it's the Northern Royal Albatross, one of the big great albatrosses. And uh, hopefully it'll happen, you know. It keeps you sort of excited to, to think that any day you go out there, something really fantastic that is completely not even on the books could happen. And that's one of the magic bits about pelagic birding and why some people get hooked on it, really. It's just, uh, you just never know what you're gonna see. But I wanted to just also give you an idea of how impressive these birds are and some of the research that's going on with them. in 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 almost a, this is sort of an imaginary thing. You almost have to close your eyes and think about this. But there are <clears throat> there are wandering albatrosses that are being tracked from South Georgia Island that have all sorts of gadgetry that measure the temperatures, what they're feeding, what they're doing, how they're moving, and so forth. And they can sense when an albatross has eaten something by the temperature of their stomach. When the temperature goes down, it means they just ate something cold which that means, you know, it's a squid or something that they ate. So they have these birds that are being tracked and there are some birds, these albatrosses that in the middle of the night, okay, so you, nobody has seen this. This is just an idea of what might be happening. They sit on the ocean and they're moving in tight circles, just tight circles, they're sitting on the water and every so often they eat something. They, they get food and you know the ocean is, food doesn't come to you in the ocean, you usually have to chase food. So this is really a mystery. And what people think might be happening and one day we'll know, you know, one day we'll be able to have this on video or something. But I think it's just magical to think that it could be a possibility is that these albatrosses land on the water and they start pattering 
in order to get bioluminescence, sort of that, you know, natural, these creatures and bacteria that create light when you, when you mess around with them, they create a bioluminescent ball at night. And squid come up to look at this ball of light, and then the albatross eat the squid. Can you imagine? This is amazing. I, I want to see this on video one day. But just the idea that this is possible also, you know, allows me sometimes to think that seabirds might be some of the coolest, most interesting birds on Earth. California is special for seabirds because I told you we have that flat area, then we can get out to deep water really, you know, relatively soon. And some of it's super deep, especially if you go down south and, and this picture to Monterey Bay um, Canyon, where there's uh, deep water just a few miles from shore. And um, there are, <clears throat> you know, ridges and valleys in, in that that creates uh, situations where water sort of moves around and creates turbulence and so forth that can bring in food towards the surface. We have the California current, which is like a conveyor belt of cold nutrient rich water that comes southward along the California coast created by all these gyres in the ocean. We have upwelling. Upwelling is when wind pushes in, in a directional manner, pushes the water out of the way, the surface water, and you get bottom nutrient rich water coming up towards the sun, and that is food. That nutrient rich water creates, um, creates all the you know, a plankton bloom and so forth that eventually ashy storm petrels will feed on. So we have the currents and upwelling, which are separate different things that create food. We also have islands for the birds to nest in, like the Farallon Islands here or the Channel Islands over towards the right, right side of this picture. We also have regimes of water that changes from colder water to warmer water. We've, uh, in fact, you know, been able to detect that we have these decade-long cycles where water can get colder and then anchovy becomes the most common, you know, uh, small fish versus when it gets warmer and sardines become the big, you know, the more common fish. So we have all these variations too. And in, in the current world, we also can download data from satellites that shows us stuff like on the left here that that uh, color that's more orangey and red is warm water, the blue is cold water, so we can go to areas where the cold and the, and the, and the hot meet, and those are really great spots. It's like going to a, an edge of a field and a forest. Those are, those are areas where two different habitats in the ocean come together. And on the right, this is chlorophyll. This is where food is happening. We can then gauge what areas have water with a lot of chlorophyll versus less. And that can change what kind of species we, you, know, you might be able to find. If you you know, um, wanna see sooty shear waters, you wanna go to a place that has a lot of chlorophyll because they you know, need densities of food. Um, and you know, introducing you to the seabirds in California, I'll just, you know, we've talked about albatross, this is the shear water, storm petrels, the alcids, skuas, skulls and turns, fowler oaks. And I'll just show you a few of these, give you an idea of what they look like. This is the, the most common shearwater in, in California, the sooty shearwater. It's all dark with sort of a pale silvery area under the wing. And these are birds that concentrate when there's a lot of food. They need densities of what we call bait or bait fish. And some of it isn't even fish, like squid. Um, so anchovy, sardines, squid, krill, Anything that's found in high, high densities, that's where common mers are gonna be found and where sooty shearwaters are gonna be found. Um, and they just need huge abundance. It's the same kind of stuff that the whales, humpback whales come, come to eat. And when you see in July, August, sometimes the high numbers of sooties, it can be just impressive, thousands, tens of thousands. I'm not gonna play this video, maybe later we can play it. But you see, this is just looking out from the ocean near my house here. And all those little black dots in the water are sooty shearwaters. There were hundreds of thousands of sooty shearwaters that day, and they were right off the beach. And they were eating masses, millions of anchovy that day. Um, so they, they require these densities. Um, <clears throat> one colony in Chile on Isla Waffle has over 4 million sooty shearwaters. So these are common birds. And then they, you know, these are, it's a map of uh, sooty shearwaters being tracked from New Zealand breeding colonies. You see that they cover the entire Pacific in a figure eight pattern, but there are areas of concentration, like, you know, Japan, Russia, the Aleutians, and that coast from British Columbia down to Baja California, where we are, that are really good sooty shearwater hotspots. And all of those places are 
are places where there's a lot of food. Other shearwaters we can see, you know, include birds that have white bellies and are bigger than the sooty shearwater, like the pink-footed here on the left that um, it breeds in Chile, or the beautiful boulder shearwater that uh, breeds in New Zealand. And has a very sleek looking and really pretty shearwater with this black and gray pattern um, that uh, we, they're a little bit uh, odd in that they come in late in the season and some years we see a lot more of them than in other years. And it depends on us getting a lot more warmer water. Pink-footed shearwater is a standard bird that comes in every, every year. Um, black vented shearwater here on the left is one that breeds in Mexico. So it's actually the closest breeding species of shearwater to us, but it's one of the most irregular because it depends on warm water. So if we have warm water that year, we'll see black vents. If we don't have warm water, they may just get to um, Monterey and not go any further north. Northern fulmars breed in the north, so in Alaska, British Columbia, and then fly south. So they're more common in winter. We don't do many trips in winter. Most of the trips we do are July to October, but there's always uh, some fulmars around. They, you know, they're around year round. The storm petrels are little guys, like just sort of bigger than the swallow, sort of like a sturdy swallow, but they're hard to see because they fly close to the water and uh, get lost, you know, behind the waves and so forth. We have forktail storm petrels. In this case, here you have an ashy storm petrel on the left and Wilson storm petrel on the right with the white rump. Ashy is sort of gray with pale on the uh, underwing. Uh, maybe that's a forktail. Oh, I don't know. I got I have to look at the original photo of that. I think it's actually an ashy. It's just uh, overexposed. Um, the um, the odd thing is that people have looked at the, the genetics now and found that storm petrels are two different families of birds. So the Wilsons is actually now not considered the same family as the ashy or the leeches, for example. Um, and one of the things about California is it was historically known for these areas where you could get flocks of storm petrels of many ashes and blacks and, and fork tails, especially in Monterey Bay. That doesn't occur anymore in Monterey Bay. The flocks have shifted north So now if the flocks form, they get flock, they fo form in Half Moon Bay or Bodega Bay at Cordell Bank, but not, not in Monterey anymore. And that's a big mystery. Why something that was so regular and so standard just suddenly shifted for some reason. But here's a mixed flock of ashy and um, forktails. Here's a, a, an ashy and a black storm petrel. The black's on the right. He's bigger and darker, doesn't have any pale on the underwing. Um, and I point out here the water temperature has a real influence on what you see and you'd never know what the water temperature is going to be on any one year you sort of have to repeat come back if you happen to be there during the cold water season you may not see black storm petrels that year they need warm water or you might want to go to southern california or elsewhere where the water is warmer to try to increase your chances of seeing a black storm petrel yet other years are really common they can be the most common storm petrel so water temperature influences um, Alcids um, <clears throat> are, you know, only found in the northern hemisphere, and uh, we have a real good diversity of alcids in in California. Sort of the the star of the show is a tufted puffin that breeds in the Farallon Islands that are only about thirty miles from from Half Moon Bay, San Francisco, and uh, several hundred breed there. We do trips to go see puffins in the breeding uh, areas in July, August. Uh, but you can see puffins and non-breeding puffins throughout the fall elsewhere. So you just uh, you just never know that with puffins, they're they're not that common. So you just have to, um, you know, find one randomly out sitting on the ocean. We um, with common mers, we often get the situation of a common mers sick on the beach, and some people will say. Um, <clears throat> You know, I saw a penguin. Of course, we don't have penguins in the northern hemisphere. And, you know, most birders will say, well, no, you know, you're wrong. You know, you, you didn't see a penguin. We don't have penguins. You know, it's a, it's a myrrh. But I want to tell you something. The alcid that's extinct, the great auk from the east coast, you know, Newfoundland to Iceland, um, the great auk was originally known as the penguin. It is the bird that actually was the penguin. And when sailors found penguins in the southern hemisphere, they misused the name, transferred it to another group of birds, and they became the penguins. So originally, alcids were penguins. So in a sense, when that lady says, or that person says to you, I saw a penguin on the beach, 
they're kind of right, they're kind of wrong. So uh, it all depends on how you look at it. Common murres though are a really abundant breeder uh, on the Farallon Islands and all the way up into Alaska and so forth. 300,000 individuals roughly breed on the Farallons, which is not too far away from Apun Bay, San Francisco. Um, masses of them, we get to see them in non-breeding plumages with the white and the teardrop dark coming back behind the eye to the dark headed uh, breeding individuals. They always have white flanks with sort of dark stripes on them. And they have an interesting breeding situation in that the young fledge from the nest before they can actually fly. It's safer for them to go to the ocean rather than to stick around on an island full of western gulls and predators that can get to them. So um, the little chicks dive into the ocean from these cliffs and then they listen for their father and they will follow their father on the water and swim sometimes 30, 40, 50 kilometers away, just swimming and eating um, until they can fly. So they get as, away from the island as fast as they can. It's not uncommon to see these little guys, um, you know, just little puff balls following the, uh, the adults around when you head out in August, late July and so forth, that time of year. Other alcids include the Katzen's Ocklet, which is a real little, you know, small dark bird that um, in, if, if it's available, they love krill. Krill is the food that they, they really specialize on and they will do best in, in breeding seasons when there's a lot of krill. And if you see masses of Cassin's Ocklets, you will often also find blue whales with, in that area. So blue whales and Cassin's Ocklets go together. And we're actually in a really good area to see blue whales but again it varies year to year it depends on when the if the food is here or it's not here so when sometimes people say well i see a blue whale you could but you can't predict any of this and that's part of what makes birding offshore frustrating is it's unpredictable but it's also what makes it fantastic because it's unpredictable um and you know when we're heading out um, we look for marble, marble murlets, little alcids that actually nest in trees. This is the last species of bird in North America to have, or regularly occurring bird, to have its nest found because nobody thought a seabird was nesting inland in old growth forest. And their dependency, at least where we are, on old growth forest is one of the reasons they're so uncommon. So they're an endangered species. Um, Pigeon guillemots uh, breed in, in the harbors and are beautiful um, with these black birds with bright red feet. And if they open their mouth, they have these bright red insides of the mouth. So we'll see them um, in most of the trips until about first week of September, then they migrate. And weirdly enough, pigeon guillemots migrate north. They're one of the few birds that heads north in the winter rather than south in the winter for us. Rhinoceros oclets, always around beautiful birds, and if you can get a breeding uh, individual with that horn, you can see why they call them rhinoceros auklets. Um, the real coveted um, alcids where we live are small murrelets that come from the south, the Scripses, Guadalupe, and Creveris. The top one on the left with white around the face is a Guadalupe. The one on the right is a Scripses, which is the most regular. And that one below uh, on the left is the Creveris. It has the pointy stick up tail. They're hard to identify, hard to find. Creveris sometimes for years will not be found in the US. If the water's not warm enough, they won't get this far north. They'll just stay in Mexico. Other years they become actually quite regular and common, especially in San Diego and sometimes right up to where we are. But Scripses is, is, is the most regular that we can see. I won't get too far into the Jaegers because you could, spend hours on Jaegers. Suffice to say that when they're in breeding plumage, they're really easy to identify. When they're not, they're really hard to identify. And there's classic stories of a Jaeger flying over, especially before the era of digital photography, where you could sort of zoom up on the picture, where that individual was called three different species. And there are only three species of Jaegers on Earth. So <laughs> that gives you an idea. The small one is long-tailed, the medium one is parasitic, the large one is Pomerane. And this is their range here in small, medium to large. Um, later in the season, the big, big Jaeger relative, um, the South Polar Skua can be, um, can be seen. Sometimes we'll see multiples in a day. We can see up to five or six in a day. That's a super day, but they're so, you know, we can go several trips without seeing any, but they're always a fun, 
fun bird to, to see offshore. And specifically because they breed in the Antarctic. They're one of the few species that we see here that breed in the Antarctic. And um, there's in fact some South Polar schools that breed well into the Antarctic. And these birds here track from King George Island. I think this is really cool in that some individuals go and winter in the Atlantic, some winter in the Pacific. That's, that's really odd. Um, so, you know, a pair could mate and, you know, they get back to the nest and says, how was your winter, honey? Well, you know, things were really hot in Hawaii. Well, uh, things were not that good and, you know, the Grand Banks, but it's totally different part of the world that they go to from this, this southern uh, hemisphere breeding area. We have the goals and turns. Of course, there's going to be goals that you see close to shore, Western goals, California goals. And as you get further offshore, some of those remain with you. But then there are others that only you see offshore, like later on in the season, winter, the kittiwake, black leg kittiwake down here on the right. And for us, a common tern is actually a pelagic bird. They, I know that you, know, you live in the Great Lakes elsewhere and you know, Saskatchewan or, or what have you, and you might be able to see common terns as a common breeding bird in summer. For us, we only see them offshore. They don't come close to shore. They become a pelagic bird here. Now, Sabin's gulls with their bright white um, pattern on the wings are always a favorite, and we can see them in the hundreds sometimes, uh, depending on the year. Arctic tern, which uh, moves south in the same period of time that the long-tailed Jaegers uh, move south, as well as the common terns and some of the savin skulls, late August, early September is a good time for them. And they're the birds that have the longest migration of any birds on Earth. These are birds in the Atlantic, not the Pacific, but they head down from the Arctic all the way to the Antarctic. Um, and if you consider the fact that they're really long-lived species, and in a 30-year lifespan of doing these long, long trips, it all adds up to an individual bird going back and forth to the moon three times in its lifetime. That's how much movement these birds do. So they're pretty cool, these seabirds. Um, real issue we have offshore is separating common versus Arctic tern. You might have this issue elsewhere on, on land someplace, but imagine trying to do this from a moving boat. Things have really changed um, with a digital photography ability to capture pictures, look in the screen and say, yep, you know, it's a common versus it's an Arctic. We've learned a lot and we've learned how to identify things by eye um, more readily by using the camera as sort of a, a way to, to confirm what we're seeing out there. Other pelagic birds, uh, you know, these are not pelagic birds. The brown pelican and the pelagic cormorant, in fact, even though it's called pelagic, it is not a pelagic bird. It, you hardly ever see them further than a mile or two from shore. So it's a, one of the most misnamed birds that we have in North America, the pelagic cormorant. Um, the phalaropes, there's two of the phalarope species that are common offshore. The red, which is the big bulky one with a thick bill, and redneck that tends to have more pattern on the back, is thinner, thin billed. And in spring, we can actually see them um, when we do May trips in breeding plumage. Um, red, uh, the phalaropes, the females are brighter colored than the males in, in breeding season. They're also bigger. Um, <clears throat> just a little story about the Shetland um, Island, you know, in Scotland, uh, um, redneck phalaropes, that they were tagged with, with um, you know, um, these, uh, oh, um, data loggers that you can, you know, once you get the bird back, you can download the data and see where it's been. And one of the most amazing things that, you know, has come out uh, in bird migration is that these birds from the Shetland Islands actually fly over to the American side, to, to Canada, move south and then cross to winter in the Pacific. So they actually cross somewhere in Central America and winter inside of the Galapagos Islands and they move back to Scotland. So they're not wintering in the Atlantic at all. Why? Probably food. Probably that's a really good place to, uh, to eat. Um, things in the last 10 years or so have really changed in California in terms of the distribution of warm water species. Boobies are now regular. Brown boobies, like this is one of the types that breeds in Mexico, the Brewster's brown booby with the white heads and the males. Um, the first sign of oddity that we had was in 2013 when we began seeing this warm water blob, what they call now a marine heat wave that lasted for several years. 
and we suddenly had masses of blue-footed boobies coming north towards us. We eventually had brown boobies, red-footed boobies. Now Nazca boobies have become regularly seen throughout, in, especially in Southern California. Um, and it's really shifted things. Um, years ago, if a brown booby showed up in our area, you know, t people would drive in from everywhere to see a brown booby. Now you can see multiple birds on a, on a boat trip. Um, it's really changed due to changing water temperatures. When we're out there too, we see whales. Um, humpback whales are most common. I've mentioned blue whales and sometimes we can see those shows um, of whales feeding, you know, lunch feeding, doing all of that crazy stuff that you think you only can see on TV. Well, we can see it out there uh, as we've, you know, gone birding and whale watching. It just is a, all around can be a fantastic outing if, if all things go well. And we take pictures of the whales flukes and send that information into Happy Whale. I've had a lot of our whales identified elsewhere in California, Mexico. Um, so that, that's interesting to take part in. Um, and multiple other marine mammals, sometimes either, even, you know, sea turtles, we'll see, you know, leatherbacks um, or sharks. You just never know what you're going to see that day. The northern right whale dolphins, a fantastic animal down low on the left there. It's a little skinny little dolphin without a dorsal fin. It's just fantastic. Killer whales will show up at times. We, um, in our part of California, we're uh, part of the offshore marine reserve um, sanctuaries. And one of the things that happens is that we are not allowed to chum uh, in, in these areas for birds. Uh, we, that may change in the future, but on the whole, we're, it's a good thing we have these reserves and these, um, these situations that are keeping um, the wildlife there, uh, but a little bit more difficult for us that so we, we can't chum. Morro Bay down south, we are allowed to chum. Um, I'll end up with a couple of stories and the things about biology and conservation of seabirds. And one of the things is how do these birds find their food? Um, they, they, they smell their, for their food. They, they're actually smelling for something called dimethyl sulfide, which um, is a similar chemical that you get in Brussels sprouts, believe it or not, or, you know, kimchi. <laughs> so it, uh, they're smelling for this. It's a breakdown product of when there's a lot of food in the water and they just sort of meander getting to higher, higher densities of this, this chemical until they find their food. So it's not that different from vultures that can smell, you know, their food. And I wanted to tell you about an interesting situation uh, that's happened over time in, down in Chile. So this photo on the left of this dead storm petrel was a bird I picked up on the side of the highway in 1998 that had down on it in November. And it was inland. And this kind of thing had been happening for years. People finding mummified birds inland of Markham storm petrel as well as Hornby storm petrel. And the thought was some, there was two, there were two camps. Some people thought these were storm blown birds that, you know, or, you know, uh, lights or something had messed them up and they were going inland because of this. Other people, including myself, thought they're nesting inland. They're nesting in the desert, in the middle of the desert. And um, some years ago, I'd probably at this point, must be six, six years ago or so, I received an email from two biologists who were doing a survey in the desert and it said at night, they had these birds that seemed to be night jars they're flying around at night and they had recorded the sound and I realized those are storm petrels. Those are probably Markham storm petrels. And I gave the information to all of my colleagues uh, at the Red de Observadores, Observadores de Aves in Chile, the rock, and the, the, the folks at the rock decided to go and try to find these birds. They went to the same spot and they indeed found that there were storm petrels in the area and they they analyzed what the place looked like, started using um, you know, Google Earth and other resources to find similar looking places. And little by little, they actually found colonies of, of Markham storm petrels in the middle of the desert where there's no rain. Like you can see what it looks like there. There's nothing. And that's part of the beauty of it. There are no predators in these areas. Um, this is from an article that was done on, on the project. And, um, 
what one of the things that if you've ever held a storm petrel in your hand they have a really distinctive musty smell it's half bird half fish something but it's distinctive and they would go around the desert finding holes in the right areas and smelling like dropping down their knees and smelling the hole to see if there was potentially a snow, uh, uh, storm petrel in there and now they've trained dogs to do it but this is how they found the colonies and some of them you know really big colonies and the holy grail was to find hornby storm petrel out in in the desert and it was done a couple of years ago they finally found the colonies of hornby storm petrel one of the most beautiful um, seabirds on earth and it is in the middle of the desert um, out there and they're not in the same places as markham storm petrels the dark ones they're in different spots and there's also um, the uh, elliott storm petrel that's breeding out in, in in these areas as well and as we move forward, we now have a theory that some other storm petrels related to Wilson's are breeding in the high Andes, probably above Santiago, perhaps 2000 meters above sea level in the mountains. We think that's where they're breeding. Now that seems nuts today, but it seemed nuts a few years ago that storm petrels were breeding in the desert. Now we know it's true. So next step is to see if we can figure out about the, uh, the birds up, um, <clears throat> in the Andes. Uh, a little bit about smell. Um, one of the odd, you know, in, in Alaska, if you go to some of these alcid colonies, crested auklets, whiskered auklets, they smell like tangerines. And the reason is a chemical called oct octalol that the birds are attracted to. And the, the stronger the smell of their mate, the more likely they will actually form a pair bond. So they're they're using smell as an attractant, sort of the same way as a, you know, you can use a, you know, fancy plume. But it also seems that this chemical decreases the chance that they're going to be infested with ticks and other, um, you know, bugs. So there's a benefit to it. Um, and I, the first I ever heard of this is that you can be on a boat, you know, get going towards these colonies and you smell the tangerines of the birds. And that to me was like, wow, that's neat. Um, I'll end with one little story about one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me as a sort of seabirder. Now, I've been involved in Birds of, of Chile, um, wrote the book, Birds of Chile. I, I was born in Chile. And um, so I do these trips, a couple of trips a year. One of the things we sometimes do is we go on a ferry to the island of Chiloé to go see penguins amongst, you know, and other birds, wet wets and so forth. That picture of the penguins, actually, if you look at them, there's two species right there, Magellanic and Humboldt penguin. It's one of the few places where you can see both nesting together. So we go on the ferry, which is a very short ferry, and I was there with my colleague, Ricardo Matus, and we uh, saw these Wilson storm petrels. We sometimes would see Wilson storm petrels there. And we saw these things go by. And after we've shown them to the group, Ricardo said, did you look at those things? And I said, yeah, they were weird. And what we looked at was the fact that there was so much white on the upper wing and there was sort of this odd contrasting look to them. And um, he said, you know what? They had white on the belly, but that you, you shouldn't have white on the belly. See, Wilson storm petrel here on the left has a dark belly and Elliot's from farther north has a pale belly. And you couldn't see Elliot's there because, because well, um, they, they don't get that far south. Um, then what happened is a group of uh, Irish and American birders who were going on a boat trip uh, just weeks later, went out and saw these same things with the white belly and sent me pictures. And I'm sitting there receiving these emails and I show Ricardo and I said, look at this thing. And he said, that's what we saw with that white belly. And at that moment, we realized this is something different. There's something different going on. These are not Wilson storm petrels. And Peter Harrison, known you know, for a seabird um, guide, he had seen these things too. And he put together a team to go and try to find them and write something up on them. And in the end, this is what, you know, this is a photograph of one of them. Um, he was able to get a lot of information. And we published a paper that described a new species of storm petrel for for the world called Pincoya storm petrel, uh, which was one of the most exciting things I've been involved in. And currently with other colleagues in Chile, we're doing a genetic study to actually see where Pincoya fits in the whole Wilson storm petrel um, situation. And it, it's, it's interesting, I'll leave it at that. And 
people ask me, what's the name? What does Pinkoya mean? Pinkoya is a goddess of that part of the world. She's a like a mythical um, woman that comes out of the ocean to dance is on the water like a storm petrel and tells you if you're a fisherman whether the fishing's going to be good or bad depending on whether she's looking at you or not looking at you. So that's the uh, story of finding a brand new species uh, of storm petrel and um, I'll tell you you know so we're finding things in the desert new species are showing up um, distributions of birds are changing um, taxonomy there are so many mysteries that are still out there, especially relating to seabirds. A lot of people think, you know, you've got to go to, you know, the Amazon or the mountains of Peru to find oddities and figure something out that is brand, brand new. But the ocean is where we have a lot of mysteries that are still out there. And well, wanted to thank you. Hopefully you enjoyed that sort of run through a bit on pelagic birds and um, we're hoping to restart pelagic trips as soon as we can. We still don't know how it'll work, what the regulations will be. We have dates at alvarezadventures.com if you look for boat trips um, starting in July. Um, and we'll see if that's possible, if we're gonna have to decrease the number of people on the boat or how it's gonna work. We're all in this brand new world, so we don't know exactly how it's gonna be, but I can tell you this much, pelagic trips will happen again. Um, it's there, yeah, it's just how we're going to do them. And next year, I have all sorts of birding trips, uh, you know, happening. Please visit our site if you want birds and wine, uh, Chile, Argentina, Bhutan, Spain, Galapagos, uh, etc. Um, but thank you, thanks, uh, Koa, for uh, inviting me and also for your amazing uh, binoculars and scopes that have really helped me to actually see these birds. So it's great. Thanks. Hey, you back? Trying to, there you go. It was a delay, I kept double clicking it. Um, yeah, so we've got a, a number of uh, really good questions. Um, maybe Elro, if you wanna stop sharing the screen. Um, yeah. Your pretty face filling the screen here. I'll. I'll uh, relay some of those to you. Um, the first one that came through was, um, is there any reasoning for why these seabirds are congregating along West coasts uh, on both continents? Is there a, any, any thought towards that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually due to the, the way that the marine currents and wind go. So those areas of having the cold water currents that come towards from the poles to the um, uh, lower latitudes and the and and that aspect as well as the you know the winds the specific winds that create the upwelling happen on that side of the continent due to sort of how the circulation um, cells go in the ocean. So you know if you go to the other side of the continent, you will get warm water that's coming down south usually. Um, or you know you have a completely different situation, sort of like the Gulf, you know, Gulf Stream. Um, I should say warm water going uh, north rather than cold water going south, like the Gulf Stream in the Pacific. I mean the Atlantic. So different, but good as well. <laughs> Perfect. No, that was good. Um, how about we had one? Any um, thought on specific sunglasses for, or any other uh, thought towards that? Do you recommend them? Use them? What do you What do you like? That's a, that's a good question because I don't, I don't use sunglasses because they mess up with my color perception. And a lot of birders have that problem. We should be using sunglasses to keep, take care of our eyes and the whole thing. And as you know, they're, you know, and some of the fishing people have really, you know, they're really into sunglasses, the fishing folks. And there's some big time good sunglasses that they go out with, but there's also sort of like a brand slash what's cool, what's not cool that, that I, I, I don't understand that, you know, um, but they definitely have some good glass and good protective ability. So you might want to go to the fishing folks to figure out, you know, what sunglasses, but I avoid them just because of the color thing. I don't know. Um, it, it, you have to relearn how to identify birds. I've, I've had the same problem with sunglasses. Like I, I like, forget it. Yeah. Um, so, um, 
It's an interesting question. I don't know how it would work. Uh, you'd have to obviously get close for lights to work, but have you ever considered a nighttime pelagic? Um, I um, suppose you could chum and, and get birds coming in on lights, but. Uh, I, we've considered doing long trips where we start out at night so that we, we pass through the, the shallower water at night and then when it, you know, daybreak, we're in the deep water. Um, some of the tuna fishing expeditions do that kind of thing. And I've been on tuna boats and, and it, it, it's cool. Um, in the East Coast, that's a lot more sort of the norm when you're in the, you know, sort of Northeast. But uh, we're not used to it in California. You know, the deep water is not that far out. So uh, it might just be uh, something to, to think about. Um, but um, yeah, we're, th we're thinking about, it. I think if, if things hadn't gone so haywire this year, we probably would be trying it this year, but we don't know, we don't wanna, you know, we don't know what to offer yet, <laughs> you know, given what the complexities may or may not be, who knows? I mean. The reality to see in the birds. Yeah. Um, so I, I answered this to a degree on a, on a broader scale for California based on eBird, but uh, what time of year is best for the Sooties at Half Moon Bay in particular? Um, it's usually uh, late July to mid August. That's when the, the biggest numbers tend to be close to shore, but, okay. but it, and it varies and it's year to year, you know, some years they don't show up, you know, yeah. Or, well, they don't show up close to shore. They always show up. They just, Different. Following the food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about a suggestion for field guides, books uh, for pelagic birding? Do you have any, any favorites there? Yeah. Um, there, there are these actually two small little booklets that Steve Howell and Brian Sullivan have created, one for the East Coast, one for the West Coast. Um, I forget if it's just called Pelagic Wildlife. Um, you know, but Steve Howell, Brian Sullivan, and they're small, easy to carry, have great photos, and both of those folks are experts, you know, and they've, they put together something that's easy, you know, and it doesn't have to be this huge tome, you know, but of course there are huge tomes that are, you know, really good as well, but if you just want to have like a reference for the uh, motel and, you know, the trip itself, those, those are really good. Okay, um, here's another one here. We've had a couple asking about how far inland are the Markhams and Hornby's petrels uh, breeding colonies? Um, I, I want to say that the one that's furthest inland is something that's over a hundred kilometers inland. Um, yeah, well inland. Um, Chile's not that thick to, <laughs> wide to begin with, so you've, you're limited, but um, they're, one of the colonies I visited was probably, you know, 20 miles inland and it was, and it's ironically about a mile from the main highway. You know, once you know it's there, it's like, how did anybody ever miss this, you know? But of course the birds come in at night, you're not expecting to have anything going on, you know, ocean bird going into the desert. And unless you're there at the right time, right place, right time of year, you're never going to know they're there. So. Yeah. I got a, okay, how about uh, this one? Um, where would you expect that the Pinkoya storm petrel breeds? I, th I think they actually breed in the mountains. Um, they're not, I don't think they breed on islands. If they did, we would know about it because there's a ton of fishing in that area. Um, you know, I think people would would have figured it out that there's a, you know, a colony of seabirds, just the local fishermen. I mean, you could probably go and do a survey of the local fishermen and, and not, you know, none of them say there's little birds breeding on these islands. So my guess is they're in the mountains. Right. Call me crazy. <laughs> okay, you're crazy. That's why I love you, man. <laughs> I was like, ah, kindred spirit. Um, <laughs> Okay, there's a couple different questions on the same, one broader, one more specific. Uh, one person's asked about, you know, uh, climate um, effects and changes in populations. And specifically, uh, someone's wrote that, um, I've heard that there's less food in the Arctic for shearwaters that has led to die-offs. Um, 
Can you talk about how climate change may affect the lives of pelagic birds? That's a huge question. Right. <laughs> huge Loaded. question. So the, the way that the ocean is warming is so complex that people don't yet understand how it's happening. So that marine heat wave we had, the blob of several years, um, people think that's asso associated with global climate change. It's also correlated with a California drought. It's also correlated with, with, with those situations when the Northeast gets the super cold winters. Um, you know, it, it's all correlated. Uh, but what's, what's the original cause? Is it, you know, shifts in ocean temperatures or what it is? It's unclear. But food is decreasing and it, and it goes in spurts and it, it's not, consistent so you will get a die-off of Casson's auklets one year that's just massive they do well the next year we have a die-off of common murs happen one year um, this you know last year short-tailed shearwaters had a really bad die-off these die-offs have happened throughout history but what's happening now is that they're bigger um, and there's die-offs that are more consistent and we're having it correlated with issues like gray whales not getting enough food in the Arctic so that they some individuals aren't making the migration back and forth um, successfully. But you have to counter that with the fact that the gray whale populations are now higher than they have been since whaling. So we have way more gray whales than we did 40 years ago. We have way more humpback whales in California than we did 40 years ago. So there's good and bad. The question is, um, how, are we in a transition point to something really negative or are we just going to have these variations and oddities and stuff that birds might be able to ride, you know, ride because these are long-lived birds. We had three years where Hearman's gulls did not breed in Baja. If they had not bred for five years, that would be really problematic. But three years they can handle. So is it, you know, they're long-lived birds. So we're lucky in that respect. If, if you were dealing with these kinds of fluctuations and you were talk, talking about short-lived birds, they'd be up the creek. Seabirds are a little bit more resilient. So I, 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 that blob thing though, that was so scary to live through where you, everything was just shifted. Everything was odd, fish that never been seen here. And it's just like, what is going on? And then things kind of reverted to sort of more normal. Now we're complacent a little bit, but if the blob comes back, then what? I don't know. So I don't know how to answer that other than something's going on. <laughs> Working on it. Yeah. Learning more daily, you know, I, it's uh, just like your mysterious storm petrol. Um, yeah. One more from uh, Facebook over here. Uh, someone's asking specifically, which one of the booby species is the rarest one to see in California? Which one of the, I guess, you know, that's shifting Northern now. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Northern Gannet, actually. There's one. Yeah. And if anybody was wondering what that's about, there's one individual Northern Gannet that's been living in California for several, uh, I know, probably about 10 years almost. And so there's one bird. It's actually not hard to see. If you live here, you can kind of, you know, it, it's got its patterns, but uh, that's pretty rare, one bird. Um, yeah. Nazca booby historically was the one that, you know, I mean, it only has really was accepted to the California checklist a few years ago, but now it seems to be more common than mass booby. So, you know, if you look longer term, Nazca booby would be the rare one, but in fact, I would say that currently mass booby might be the rarest. Um, and red footed booby is the other one that you know, has been historically rare, but we had, you know, so many records recently that that's shifted too. Right. Definitely brown boobies, the most regular. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and then I guess uh, a couple, that seems to be it for questions. We'll wrap that up, but uh, I do want to mention a couple other things. Uh, people have mentioned it throughout. Will this be available after the fact? Once again, this is being concurrently live streamed on Facebook and will live on the Facebook page for time and optics, but also uh, we will 
um, post this onto our YouTube channel for Koa Sporting Optics. So that's uh, youtube.com backslash users backslash Koa Sporting Optics. Uh, and you can link to that off of our um, Koa Sporting Optics Facebook page as well. You'll see it. Um, this is a personal question, but uh, how about optics? What optics do you like to use on your pelagics? So, the, as you know, Jeff, there's like a, there's an issue of like some people, the power issue. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, people have tried to convince me that I should not use a 10 power binocular because my angle, you know, field of view is too narrow and so forth. But I've never had a problem using a 10 power binocular. Right. And my hands don't shake. And so for me, I would use a 10 power binocular, you know, I mean, these, I'm that guy, you know, the, yeah. these guys, you know, are, are, are doing it for me on the pelagics everywhere. Even but, 10 and a half. You're, you're a stud. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I forgot about the half, you know, yeah. that's sort of like sort of saying, you know, I'm five foot one and a half, you know, <laughs> a bit more. yeah. All right. But it, um, it, anyway, I, I think that a lot of beginner bird, not well, let's not say beginner birders, a lot of birders, most birders would rather not have a 10 power binocular on a on a boat because they want a wider field of view, less shaking. Um, but it, it becomes a personal thing. I do like a heavier binocular that I can, you know, sort of uh, the, you know, really hold steady. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes a smaller binocular for me is harder to hold steady. So yeah, agreed. Yeah, I mean, like, just there's nothing to anchor them yeah. in, in place. They're kind yeah. of bouncing. So what yeah. do you think? What would be your you know? I I've, I've never been man enough to hold a ten. I'm a shaky individual. Depending on, <laughs> I'm unstable. So take that yeah. as you will. So I've always been the guy with sevens and eight powers, um, and a sucker for field of view. But it's all good. Um, I guess with that, we'll uh, one more time remind everyone that you can, uh, if you're going to be buying some optics, this is a, an opportunity um, to visit timeandoptics.com. You can support um, conservation and the Black Swamp Bird Observatory um, if you are, you know, one of the folks that go to the biggest week religiously and, and enjoy that. Um, the the biggest week is an opportunity. Uh, they'll be given 5% back of every um, optic sold um, to the folks uh, there at the Black Swamp Bird Observatory. Um, and I think we have covered it all. Elro, thanks for your time, man. It's good to see you uh, virtually, if not if not in person. Look forward to the latter soon. Hopefully we can uh, maybe do a, a COA boat trip. Yeah, that, that would be, you know, once we get things going. I, I would also like to say, well, thanks to you guys for putting these together, these series of, of talks, and that it, it's weird to give a, a talk to no audience, but I, I appreciated the chat kind of things scrolling by. I couldn't read them all, but I appreciated all those people who sort of said things because, uh, you know, it makes you realize that people really are out there. Well, that's great to know. And everybody take care out there, right? Keep safe, healthy, and try to be, ha you know, go outside, look at some birds, get yourself uh, out of the zone of worry. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's 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 good mental health. And yeah, yeah. you had uh, triple digit viewers from, I don't know how many countries exactly, but I know we had uh, people pre-registered from over 10 countries. So- oh, uh uh, and, and you knocked it out of the park is really interesting information. So overall, thanks again. Uh, thanks to our friends at uh, uh, Time and Optics um, and the Biggest Week in American Birding. Uh, thanks to our friends at Optics for Birding, who I see um, checked in uh, in your close to your neck of the woods there, El, not too far away in Irvine. Um, so thanks again, all. Um, look forward to seeing you at our next uh, event, which will be Saturday, next Saturday at noon. We're doing a digiscoping deep dive with Simon Brunby, one of the best digiscopers in the world. Wow. All right, folks, um, checking out. Thanks again. All right.